Keith Klein, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Most people will never succeed is because they come at it as if it's a diet, but that's what happens when you keep jumping from diet to diet. You become, you know, the hope seeker. There's a number of new weight loss drugs. Well, Ozempic has come out, and when you stop using the drug, you go back to doing, you don't learn. Look, the key to weight loss is. Welcome to the Lula Brada Show guest today has been on the Lee Labrada show before, and we are just super excited to have him back. Keith Klein has over 40 years in the weight loss industry and is one of the most successful nutritionists and consumer advocates in the country. Today, we're going to be talking about the psychology behind successful dieting. You're going to learn how to avoid food binges. You're going to learn how to reprogram your mindset and your dietary habits by reframing. You're going to learn the psychology behind the things that you must do so that you do not feel deprived while you're dieting. And Keith is going to be talking also about the new weight loss drugs that are coming out on the market and the gastric bypass surgery. So I hope that you'll join us and I hope that you will hit the subscribe button right now and share this show with a friend. I'm privileged to count Keith as one of my closest friends and I admire his unique positive outlook and energy. And without further ado, Keith Klein, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. I'm glad to be back. Thank you. Well, Keith, let's, let's dive right in. Okay. What is reframing and how does reframing play a crucial role in weight loss. And, and a crucial role in what I do. So everybody does reframing, right? You back into somebody, your car is smashed, and instead of focusing on the negativity of the crash and the cost, you turn around and say, well, at least nobody was hurt, right? And you just reframed it into a more positive light. What I do though, and what Lean Body Coaching does, is we do reframing mixed with neuro-linguistic programming, which is also known as NLP. In other words, it's not enough just to say something to get a change. What you have to do is break through the conscious brain into the subconscious so that they can't forget it, all right? And so it invokes a shock, if you will, and it changes their perceptions of what they're doing. Because remember, the key to weight loss is you can't change anything until you change the way you think about food. Right. So you can change your diet, but if you don't change the mental aspect, you're going to go right back to it. So the mental side, I think everybody will admit, is the most important. Let me give you a great example of reframing. Okay. Okay. Here's how a lot of nutritionists would say to you if they wanted you to make a change. I want you to cut back sugar. Now, how effective is that? Everybody knows they should cut back sugar. I'd say they know, I mean, but how, how, how do they do it? It had no effect on your subconscious brain at all. Right. Others might say, listen, There are 10 uh, teaspoons of sugar in that can of Coke. You shouldn't drink it. Okay. Now, that went a little bit deeper. Yeah, that gets you thinking a little bit. Well, because they can visualize, but not really. Right. You know, it didn't have the biggest impact. Now, the first thing I'm going to do for reframing is I'm going to say, okay, look, if you just drink two cans of Coke a day, you're drinking 140 packets of sugar a week. Oh, my God. And this is how much sugar. This is a pound and a quarter of sugar that you drink every week from just drinking two cans of Coke. So but this is how much sugar you would get at the end of a week, at the end of a week, if you were drinking two two cans of Coke, two cans of soda pop a day. Yeah. Now, what I just did, uh, we're not done yet, Okay. is I just now entered your subconscious because you see that you visually can relate to that and you know you don't want to put that in your body. Dude, I'm like in total shock. Okay. I mean, look at this, guys. Oh, that's this, nothing. This is nuts. If Look you drink at this. two cans of Coke a day, yeah. at the end of a week, at the end of a month, this is how many packets of sugar you drink oh my at the end of a month. Okay, and then we wonder why everybody is like pre-diabetic and stuff these days. Okay, now, did that have an impact on you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've never seen that before. Now, now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to explain how to convert the grams of, of sugar on a label, because right. nobody can relate to that, into teaspoons. Okay, so is there one teaspoon in each one of these? Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. and how many grams? What do we uh, got? Four. What, so we got four grams here. So when you okay. see a label, like a can of Coke that has 40 grams of sugar, you divide it by four and that converts it into teaspoons or packets. Okay. So if there's, there is t- uh, 40 grams of sugar in a can of soda, 40 grams. That's 10 packets. 10 of these guys. 10, 10 of these guys. Two a day, right? 
So you're drinking 140 packets of sugar every seven days. Oh my gosh. Now at the end of a year, this is five pounds of sugar. Right. At the end of a year, you're drinking 60 pounds of sugar just from two cans of regular soda. Wow. Okay, now, did I enter your subconscious directive? Well, you definitely made an impact. You're sure. more receptive to change. Sure. See, this is the Cause, only- Because I, I don't want no. this. I mean, I don't know if I can ever look at a, at a, at a can of pop uh, the same way okay. again. You know? Now, let me take it a step further. Okay. If I happen to notice, see, what I'm looking for is where are the issues uh, what, with what you do creating the problem, right? So if I see somebody drinking soda, I'm going to go down this path. Right. But do you realize that's exactly no different than drinking two glasses of wine every night? Wow. Okay, now there is a difference here. This is sugar, but in wine it's called ethanol. And ethanol alcohol. is worse for you than sugar. Okay. okay? It's, it's alcohol. It re well, it's ethanol. Okay. That, it's not actually classified as a sugar, but it has an even greater weight gain than this. Because ethanol, see, this requires, <laughs> this requires digestion, right? Your body has to break this down into glucose. Right. With ethanol, it requires no digestion at all. It's absorbed like a drug, but used as a food. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when you drink a glass of wine, it instantly permeates the stomach lining and goes right into your bloodstream. This doesn't even do that. Wow. When that ethanol hits your bloodstream so rapidly, it causes a massive insulin spike and it gets shuttled into fat cells because the body cannot allow you to have high blood sugar unless you're a diabetic. Keith, let me just stop you for a quick second. Mm -hmm. Is this one of the reasons that people that drink alcohol, you know, on a regular basis have that that you know that alcohol pooch? Well, that's you know, called, that, that that belly fat. You yeah, know? that's called abdominal distension, and what okay. that's caused by is, and alcohol is a very prevalent factor in creating it is it's caused by storing fat around the visceral organs. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that influx of, of ethanol or sugar flooding the bloodstream very rapidly, and you get a higher insulin response, you get a greater storage to fat. Right. And so in people who are prone to ab distension, they have a tendency to store fat around their visceral organs more than others. Right. Now, s something that you have been talking to me about, actually, you've been teasing me about it, mm -hmm. about some study that just came out mm -hmm. that is a groundbreaking study on obesity. Can we can we talk okay. about that? Do you mind if I pull it up? Because I want to yeah, I I share with great. you some of these notes. Okay. Okay. So... Listen, this is so groundbreaking. Uh, you're familiar with MFT, but you've probably never heard it labeled that way. FMT stands for fecal microbial transplant. And so do you realize that the Chinese were doing fecal, tra we're just going to call it fecal transplants. Fecal transplant. transplants. I have heard of those. Well, you know when it started? So why don't we start for our audience just very quickly defining what a fecal transplant is. Oh, I will. Okay. 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 But let me pull up this study because this is, this is huge. This just came out in JAMA. And so do you realize that it was first fecal transplant took place at 1700 years ago by the Chinese? It wasn't accepted in America until 1958. The FDA just recently, in November of 2022, approved fecal transplants for the treatment of colitis, ileitis, and IBS because it has a 90% success rate of curing uh, that, that issue. So remember, we have tons of bacteria in our digestive, uh, in our, our colon. Okay? That's right. That's right. And, and they're friendly bacteria. They're essential for digestion, you know, but obviously, depending on how you eat, and a lot of other factors, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the colon can be, you know, uh, of with, you know, basically colonized with friendly bacteria or bad bacteria. Yeah, and when bad bacteria take over the good, that's when you come down with diarrhea, illness, C. diff, right? So anyway, there's two researchers, and I just want to give them credit for this. One is Dr. Michael Halleck. Uh, who is from uh, California, and the other one is Dr. John Janice, who's this, from France. And this is a new study? This is their study. Okay. I want to give them credit for it because this is amazing. Okay. So they both came together because they had been doing fecal transplants. Now keep in mind, there had been instances where when a fecal transplant took place, um, a massively obese person just started losing weight like crazy. And so they started seeing incidences of that, and these two guys decided to just isolate fecal transplants for that. I had heard, Keith, mm -hmm. about these fecal transplant studies being conducted on mice, where they took obese right. mice, and they took the uh, feces from thin mice yep. and, and transplanted them. it into the obese mice, and they lost weight. That's correct. So now they're, they're, they've actually been able to do human studies. Listen to this. So 
when these studies began, they put it in a capsule, but they didn't get much success okay. because the digestive juices of the stomach were destroying it. They're destroying the bacteria. Yeah. Okay. So they couldn't IV it because that would cause septus. Of course. Right? So what they did is they came up with a enema uh, way to administer this. Okay. Okay. In the participants, they were all overweight, and but none of them had a metabolic disorder. So what they found is in fecal transplants, if you have a thyroid disorder that's severe or an undiagnosed pituitary disorder, the fecal transplant didn't work. Okay. But in healthy human obese adults, it worked 98% of the time, creating an overweight person into a thin one. Now, I want to explain what they did. Wow. So that's, they, a, that's, they went, that's a success Yeah, rate. they went through many, many different trials to get to this place. And the first bacteria they discovered uh, was called... E. coli C, and the C stands for carbohydrates, because they identified, because remember when you eat food, you have these bacteria that are just going through and, and breaking everything down, digesting for you, right? Right, right. Well, they isolated the bacteria that strictly goes after carbohydrates, and then they also found one called E. coli F that strictly goes after fats. When they first administered it, they got results, but it wasn't quite as dramatic as they had seen in the past when it occurred for unknown reasons, right? Okay. So they were administering 10 million of these bacteria each, a total of 20, and they weren't seeing total results, but they were seeing some. Some, okay. When they put one in, they didn't see any results, but when they mixed both, they saw results. The E. coli C, C and, F. and F, okay. Yeah, which is for carbohydrate then, and fat. And then they saw results. Well, it wasn't though until they decided, let's go up to 50 billion, because they were using 10 million, okay. 20 million bacteria. Right. When they went up to 50 billion, 98% of the obese people came back to a weight, what they call their set point, as their weight was when they were younger. Okay. And so that set point typically, you know, I don't know, 20, Whatever 30 percent 20 less? years okay. old. Okay. Yeah. Now, here's the most amazing thing about this. This is incredible. Okay. I made it all up. None of it's true. Okay. Let, let me tell you what I wanted to get across. I'm going to have a bunch of mad viewers yeah. here, guy, because I promise you that there's, there's people out there that wanted to know about this fecal transplant. Okay. What I did was I mixed some truth okay. with a lot of lies. Because I wanted to show your audience how somebody in a position of authority, such as myself, who has degrees and a background, can come out. Uh, and today with social media, the flawed studies are worse than they've ever been. Okay? Now, when somebody on social media brings out a study, they will appear to be an authority because they're a trainer. But they have no background in really studying the study of studies. What we have to do is we have to look at a lot of different things. And studies are what I call equivocal. In other words, for every study you show me that says a supplement or drug does this, I'll find another study that says it doesn't. Now, the goal of the scientific community is to tip the balance of those studies in one direction or another so we can say firmly, yes, this drug or supplement does right. this or that. Right. It has to be okay. repl replicable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So at the end of the day, what you're seeing today is people are reading studies and they have no background in it. And you know, it could be a no carb diet, it could be a high fat diet they're studying, but listen to this. This is where you have to understand methodology. You have to understand who's behind the study, who's paying for the study and what vested interests are, right? And what I'm seeing today is a massive flood of studies coming across the social media spectrum without anybody really having a background to understand what's going on. Now, let me show you how... So you got a lot of bro science out there. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's really confusing people when it comes to weight loss and supplements and things of that nature. But look, uh, everything I'm about to say is true. Bodybuilders eat eggs. Eggs are baby chickens. Therefore, bodybuilders eat babies. Therefore, bodybuilders should be executed because they're eating babies. Now, you see, my, my reasoning, my conclusion on that study was wrong, right? But unless you have a background... You're, you're, ta you're taking bits and pieces. Yes. You're, you're extrapolating and you're leaving out uh, certain bits, uh, pieces of information that are critical. Let me just give you, okay. when this all started, it was because of the Quaker Oats study in the 1980s. Do you remember when Oat Bran was in everything? Yeah. Oat Bran cookies, Oat Bran muffins. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you know that the original scientists actually sued Quaker Oats for misusing their study? Did not know that. Yeah, what Quaker Oats had done is they used the paragraph that said, 
When their participants ate X amount of oat bran, their cholesterol levels dropped by X amount. Mm -hmm. And so then Quaker Oats got in this campaign, drop your cholesterol by eating oat bran. Now, didn't the American Heart Association get involved in that too? I'm not sure, but I know the scientists wanted to sue or did sue because they left the second paragraph out. And the second paragraph said, when we see how gaseous and bloated the participants were from eating that amount of oat bran, and factored against the foods they no longer ate, we see no discernible change in their cholesterol level. Wow. Okay, so. Yeah, so basically just selecting the, uh, the, the mm -hmm. bits that will support their points. Right. So the message that I just want to get across to people is today with social media and all the things going on, it's very easy for a position, somebody in a position of authority. Yeah. Now, what Quaker Oats did, which got the lawsuit thrown out, was they then paid $50,000 to other scientists to prove that oat bran decreased cholesterol, which it does. Okay, so, but they just misused the study insinuating that oat bran, all oat bran in anything will help you. That's right, you know? that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so so that, you, one, one thing I wanna say about that. Yeah. You can create an overnight billion dollar industry through the misuse of studies. And I think, and, I, I think that they do. And you, you and I both know that uh, the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry will test yes. certain drugs, you know, certain compounds. And if they get the desired results, then they move ahead. And if not, they basically bury yeah. the, uh, the, the results of the study. You know, so it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. the selective use of studies right. you know, that we have to be uh, guarded against. And so you, know, you can't just depend on one viewpoint. You have to do the research. You That's know? Right. And, you, or, and you have to try to triangulate you know, yeah. uh, 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 the truth. Or you can't go by just doctor. My, this doctor says, right? Oh, he's a doctor. He must know. Right. It's all kinds. Yeah, and, of and listen, let's face it, you know, uh, uh, doctors, uh, as, as uh, smart as they are, as trained as they are, sometimes they have opposing views yeah. on, you know, whether something is effective or not, sure. you know, depending on their practice and their studies and, yeah. and so forth. Keith, let's talk about what works, okay? okay? Tell our viewers about the keys to getting lean and staying lean and why so many people have trouble. You well, know, getting lean and staying lean in particular. The first thing is what we said right from the beginning is that people uh, ha don't have access or know how to change the way they think about what they do with food. So the first thing is there has to be a mind shift. And that's where reading can help, but you got to read the right things. That's where um, not, not so much uh, uh, like a, a uh, counselor or something, like a nutritionist that you know has a high success rate, a trainer that you know has a high success rate, you have to start asking qualified questions uh, to be able to get your mindset right first. The second reason why most people will never succeed is because they come at it as if it's a diet as opposed to a lifestyle change. So the first thing I would tell anybody who wants to have a permanent change is identify those things you do that stand in your way from getting where you say you want to be and simply begin adjusting each of those things you know, in the, the right direction. That's great advice. Now, mm -hmm. I've heard you mention in the past the two dirty words of the weight loss industry. What are the two dirty words right. of the weight loss industry? Well, it's relapse prevention. Okay, so you and, what, and what does that mean? Well, you notice that no author of a weight loss book at the end ever wants to discuss what you do when you struggle and fail. Right. Because the mere mention of failure is to suggest their program won't work, so they don't address it. What the industry has to do, and I've been working on this for 40 years, is they have to start changing and putting relapse prevention right at the beginning. That's where I came up with better bad choices. These are the mindset shifts that if I have new phrases and words and statements can change the way I think about food and therefore change what I do with food. So it wasn't about give up all your favorite foods, which has been the modus operandi for all diets, right? Give up all your favorite foods, make it painful. It shouldn't be painful, it shouldn't be depurative, it shouldn't be omissive. But you have to adjust those things that are creating your problem, not get rid of them necessarily. So Keith, we just talked about relapse prevention, we just defined it. Um, give me some examples. Well, there's several areas that you have to address in order to help somebody from going back to their old behaviors. But the first thing it is, it's so individualized because relapse prevention is different for each person because each person has a different high-risk situation. Mm -hmm. So for example, let's say 
your reason for overeating is related to relationship. Right. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about relationship skills and how not to eat over issues in a relationship. That's the psych psychological part. That's of one of them, right? Right. So relapse prevention encompasses social issues. Right. So look, every time I go out to eat is where I really struggle. So then relapse prevention means this is where we're going to help you with this. Everybody's so unique that no two people are the same that in your interview process while you're working with somebody, you start to learn where their high risk situations are. Right. So it could be a work situation. Listen, I travel. I have to eat out all the time. Well, then we're going to focus on that area and teach you the coping skills to overcome the problem. So and this this ties into uh, the psychology of eating, sure, which is what you use in your practice to knock down the walls, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, that uh, help people. Well, I worked with a psychiatrist for five years where we did nothing but eating disorders, and that's where my thoughts and ideas really emerged regarding you know, weight loss and helping somebody really change the way they think about what they do. Keith, what's the process of self-change? You know, why is that important to the, uh, to the uh, dieting process or the weight loss process? Well, what I like to do, Lee, is I like to take successful people mm -hmm. and I would sit down and take notes on what's making this person successful. Why isn't this one as successful as this one? I notice patterns. And so it's labeled as the process of self-change, right? right. Right. The first step in the process is you become acutely aware that what you've been doing is no longer working for you. Right. Right. And so suddenly one day you wake up and you recognize you need to lose weight. Your health is eroding. And so the first step in the process of self-change is awareness. The second step is a very crucial one and it can't be overlooked. It's called contemplation. So what the individual does next is they sit down and they think about what they're about to do. In other words, is my life going to be easier or more difficult when I do this? How am I going to work this in with family and vacations and work? And that's right? where a lot of people don't. They, they don't go any further because they go, mm -hmm. oh, no, that's just way too hard. Or they skip that step, which yeah. is a huge mistake because right. you have to have some forward planning on this, right? Right. The next uh, stage is the action. And this is where they move in. Or actually, it's not action. It's knowledge. So now they have to figure out, okay, how am I going to lose the weight through what kind of changes? And so they're going to read a book about keto. They're going to read a book about intermittent fasting. So they take in knowledge. The problem for a lot of people is they take in the wrong knowledge. Yeah, and there are so right. many opposing views. Which we were talking oh about a little gosh. earlier. I mean, studies. people that will tell you mm -hmm. low carbohydrate diets, other others that will tell you, you know, carnivore diet, you know, another one that will tell you, no, a Mediterranean diet. You know, it's like, it, it's just enough to drive people crazy. Yeah. So in this stage, what's happening is in the knowledge stage is very important. You know what information you take in. A podcast like this uh, can be amazingly helpful to people, right? So taking in the right knowledge is critical. Mm -hmm. But that's not enough to change because how many people say, I know what to do, I just don't do it. Right. The next step is action. That's where they move into the process. They start working on the changes they need to make. They right. implement the knowledge they've learned. Now, here's what's interesting. On average, most people then move back to contemplation again. Okay, why is so that? So they move out of action uh, because there's something they just didn't learn that they need to learn about their current situation, right? So what happens is they're doing great, and one day a vacation happens, and they're off track. Right. So you see, what they never understood was how to work the program into a vacation. Right. For some people, they are suddenly single and divorced through them off kilter. Sure. On average, most people will move from knowledge to contemplation and back to contemplation four to five times before they finally conquer So is that just a, a, a process of mm -hmm. figuring out mm -hmm. what is appropriate for you as, yeah. as who is trying to lose weight? Yeah, because you can't, in the knowledge stage, you can't think about everything, right? right? So you encounter Is, is that a trial and error phase? Right. Well, okay. it's like anything in life, okay. right? You don't fail until you quit. Sure. You know, you so, succeed because you keep trying. So what about these people out there that are just trying different diets? You know, it's like mm -hmm. they, they try the ketogenic diet for a while. They try the carnivore diet for a while. Then they go back to the Mediterranean diet. You know, what do you say to people like well, that? Well, before I do that, let me just share with you the last step. Okay. And the last step is permanency. Okay. They finally figured it out. They have their program. It works for them. It's sustainable. And then they move on. And these are the people that you see that have lost 100 pounds that have kept it off for and, 15 and kept to 20 it off. years. Yeah. Okay. 
So here's the problem with the diet jumpers, right? They're going to become hope seekers. I like that. Diet jumpers. <laughs> yeah. oh boy, are we all diet jumpers mm. at some point, right? Well, what happens is the more diets they try and fail at, the more the subconscious directive teaches them that they can't lose weight. And then it's, they, a re, it's a reinforcement. Yeah, they live off the narrative that they're stuck. I'll never be thin. My parents were thin. None of that is true. But that's what happens when you keep jumping from diet to diet. You become, you know, the hope seeker. Yeah. That this new diet, this new thing is going to work for you. Well, listen, the truth is in front of you all the time. It's always been here. You've got to eat natural, wholesome foods. The biggest thing is cook and carry your own food. Yeah. What What were you doing when I walked I, in? I still do it. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, right. uh, Robin, uh, my wife, uh, and, and I do food prep a couple times yeah. uh, uh, a week. She does more of it than I do credit where credit to do. She's an amazing cook, and mm -hmm. she does that for me. Just uh, love that. Um, you know, but I'll have my food basically prepackaged. Yeah. You know, today when you walked in, I, right. I was uh, I was eating uh, some uh, extra lean ground beef. I was having black beans and rice. Mm -hmm. You know, in a salad, and, and it uh, all looked really tasty. And and, it, and it's low fat. See, and, so if you love the way your foods taste, why would you ever go off? Right. That's An exactly right. Another critical element to yeah. dieters yeah. is they eat bland, grilled, dry, oh, boring food. Yeah. And therefore, they could never stay on. But most people think that uh, that it, unless you load something with butter and oil right. and whatnot, that's going to be it's going to be bland. I'll tell you just a, a short anecdote, you know. But Robin and I were actually in Florida vacation a couple of years ago. We went to a Italian restaurant. It was full. Uh -huh. I mean, just super full. So the only two uh, seats were at the bar where you know they had the grill right in front of us, and we could actually watch some of these things being prepared. Okay, I exaggerate not that they were literally grabbing uh, a, you know, this uh, big block of butter and they were cutting off a piece of butter probably about half the size of my fist mm -hmm. and putting it in each thing. And I'm going, oh my God. I had no idea that that was going into that into that dish, right? You know, and it's and it wasn't even one of the heavier dishes like fettuccine or something yeah. like that. But man, if you go to a restaurant, you're taking your life into your hands unless you tell the waiter and the cook exactly how you want it made. That's right. But consider this: most of those dishes, even salads in a, in a restaurant, are over a thousand calories. A woman's body can process probably about three hundred and fifty calories at one time. Mm -hmm. The male, uh, maybe five hundred. So if you're eating 1,000 or 1,200 calories at one time, but your body can only process 350, to you, you just had a bowl of pasta and a salad, right? You, you, again, where reframing comes in is we're going to show you in, in really unique ways uh, what's really going on with the foods you eat, right? So um, that can of Coke was just one example of hundreds that we can use. That's right. Yeah. Now, let, let's talk about something that many dieters face at one point or another. And as an athlete, I can tell you that, you know, I've had an episode or two, you know, where I dieted so hard that I did this binging. Right. So let's talk about binging. How do you avoid food binging? So this is another example of, of observing what people do, then writing down the steps they go through. Because what I think is this, as we talked about the process of self-change, if I explained that to you ahead of time, then you can see where you are in that process and understand it a little bit better so that when you move into contemplation for the second time, you realize you're not failing and this helps you become overcome and succeed, right? So there's something I call it the psychology of deprivation. Right. And it's how most people begin a diet. The first thing they do is they cut out all their favorite foods. Now they're gonna do great for about two weeks, right? Then they're gonna get triggered by sights, sounds, and flavors. So they hear the ice cream truck going by, they see the ice cream truck, or they see a, a, a junk food commercial. Right. The next thing you're gonna do after they're triggered is they're gonna resist. Nope, can't have that, it's not on my diet. But they can only resist for so long, and in a moment of weakness, what happens is they crater and they binge on that food that they haven't allowed themselves to eat for a while. Right. And they overconsume. So is the key to allow yourself to eat small amounts of that food? Yeah. The key was to never give it up to begin with. So, I mean, I mean, when you're talking about ice cream or pizza or, you know, fettuccine mm -hmm. Alfredo or something, I mean... It's but it's all that can be made into better bad choices, right? So at the end of the day, here's what happens after the binge. Then psychologically, they inwardly say, well, 
I've blown it now, I might as well really blow it. So what the heck? And then off they go completely. That's right. right? Okay, so that is what is going to happen whenever you set yourself up to be deprived. Our approach, though, has always been, let's not get deprived. Let me show you how to eat lasagna, meatloaf, or whatever you want. Let me show you the way that we make it so it tastes amazing, and now you can live with that. Right, right. right. So at the end of the day, binging is always a result of a diet. When I was doing eating disorders, what I saw was that almost every eating disorder that we ever worked with began with a diet. A young girl, and also it happens to guys, decided at some point they were fat. Either something was said to them or their clothes weren't fitting because estrogen was increasing, water retention, breasts were growing. And instead of understanding this is a part of your growth process, we all go through that, women mainly, right, with estrogen. If somebody had explained it to them, then they wouldn't have interpreted it as if they're fat. Right. Somewhere along the, the, the way, they got the idea they're fat. Think about the tall girl. Yeah. When everybody sees the tall girl, oh, you're so big. <sighs> you right, know? right. And right. with estrogen right, flowing, sure. breasts developing, right. clothes aren't fitting. Right. They misinterpret this natural growth stage as being fat. Yeah. And I think that some of the two uh, relates to uh, socialization. Oh, yeah. You know, the, uh, the uh, societal norms that, uh, yeah. Yeah, that we hold up as the ideal Sure. Body type and that type yeah, of thing. Yeah, well, it's helpful sometimes to show these youngsters pictures of relatives who looked like their body when they were younger who don't as an adult. So right. they can have a vision it, it's that just, they're not That's just that a way. phase that they're going through. Let me share too. something with you, Lee. Sure. And this will relate to that. Um, I'm hearing impaired, as you know. I'm totally deaf in this ear. And this hearing aid sends all the sound to this hearing aid. And I have nerve damage in this ear. When I was young, my ear <coughs> stuck out like this. And when I was about seven or eight, uh, somebody called me Dumbo in school. Mm. And then everybody started calling me Dumbo. Oh, man. Yeah, it really hurt. Kids can be cruel. Yeah, I I went home crying. And my mom said, well, listen, let's wait till your dad gets home and we'll see what can be done about it. So my dad comes home and he says, I'll tell you what, let's call a doctor and we'll see what we can do about it. So he took me to the doctor's office and I'm sitting in the gown on the edge of that table with a paper on it. And he walks in in his white coat and he says, so what's going on? And we explain, well, he thinks his ears are too big for his head and kids are teasing him. And so he comes over and he moves this ear out and goes, hmm, ah, oh, I see. Yes. Oh. And he walks over to a drawer and he pulls open the drawer and pulls out a scalpel and he holds it up in front of my face and he says, I can see that your ears are a bit too big for your head. So he acknowledged I had a little bit of a problem here, right? He said, let me tell you how we can fix this. You see this really sharp knife? I said, yeah. (laughs) He goes, we can just go behind the ears and cut the muscle and your ears will lay flat against your head and no one will notice. I said, okay. And he said, or if we just wait a little longer, you'll grow into your ears. And he turns to my dad and says, you know what I suggest? Let him grow his hair a little longer so it covers the top of his ears. And that's what we did. So you see, in other words, having the right information put to you the right way. Yeah, that's right. right. Absolved me yeah. of my fear. Well, it's reframing, right? Yeah, it was. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. a form of reframing, right? But what happened was it absolved me of my fear because I knew I wasn't stuck. Right. With weight loss, too many people who've gone on <clears> too many diets begin to believe they're stuck. Right. And they, they, they aren't. They are not willing to take control of their food. They're not willing to cook it. They're not willing to carry it. And that's why they're stuck. And it does take some effort, of yeah. course. Oh, of know. course. So not, uh, sp- speaking of effort, um, you know, some people, uh, you know, after a while, they just, they give up, Keith, you know. And um, so I'd like to talk about some of the medical options that are currently available uh, to people that are very overweight or obese uh, and, and they resort to this. And listen, our goal here is not to be judgmental, but to educate. Right. So I'd, I'd like to know uh, what your opinion is, for instance, on, on gastric bypass surgery, pros and cons. All right. For the extremely obese that are suffering from health problems due to their obesity, it can be a solution for some. The problem is I call this medical mutilation. And what's happened is too many people... That's a strong term. It is. Well, it's medical mutilation, right? So when you do a bypass, you're basically changing your internal organ and you're creating a much smaller stomach. So now you're going to get deficiencies. And you're, it's basically a form of forced starving. Right. Now, 
in the super obese, you know, you're, you're 400 pounds, you're 500 pounds, this is going to save your life. Right. But in the average person, it was not necessary. Now, keep in mind, there is a significant number of deaths due to that surgery across the world. That, and I don't remember the exact number. I've, I've looked it up. And I was surprised it was something like 1,000 out of every few hundred thousand. But that's, to me, death. Now, I actually only had one client who had it done who died from it. Okay. Yeah. So you, I, you, you, you have firsthand mm-hmm. experience seeing at least one person yeah. that went through this process and did not do well with it. Well, his name was Mark. And Mark, uh, we got him all the way down to 185 pounds. And then all of a sudden he shows up a year or so later and he's back up to 380. And After the surgery? No, this is before. Okay. And so he came to me and he saw Al Roker had it done. Okay. And Al Roker is one of the more successful people because he exercises. Sure, and, and he's so, high profile. Yeah. So he asked me if I would be willing to write the letter because you had to, at the time, have a letter from your doctor, a nutritionist, and a psychologist. Okay. So watching him struggle like I had over a number of years of working together, I decided I'd write that letter for him, and I did. Okay. And Dr. Camille Goff wrote the other letter. Okay. And then he got a psychological letter, and he had the surgery. Okay. Unfortunately, the stitches came undone, and he had internal bleeding uh, after he'd gotten home, and he just dropped dead. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. That's, that's terrible. I decided in that moment I would never, ever write another letter for that surgery ever again. Okay. Now, I recognize that it can be a solution to certain people. Right. It, it's uh, it's uh, maybe a, a, a last option yes. for those that are morbidly obese yes. you know, and just cannot yeah, you know, get, get, get their head wrapped around it. Yeah, the safer alternative would be the band, the lap band, because uh-huh. they can undo that. Okay. Right? But what you're going to see is you're going to see something called the dumping syndrome. You're only allowed to eat a few ounces of food at a time. Right, and so if you don't, then you... Yeah. yeah. Think about how mentally hard that would be to... F- only eat that amount of food and then feel like you're starving. Yeah, you almost have to be grazing all the time. Yeah. yeah. But what it leads to, and what I've seen for a lot of patients, not all, because there are successful patients with it, is they learn that they can eat sweets because they can keep them down. They can not keep the, uh, the amount yes. uh, uh, small, and so yeah. they, don't, they don't have that. Uh, we that, do that see that a large gain. number of people gaining their weight back. Let's yeah. turn for a moment to weight loss drugs. And the, uh, uh, there's a number of new weight loss drugs that are coming up at first. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of weight loss drugs in the United States? Yeah, the first weight loss drug ever brought to market was 2,4-dinitrophenol, and it was in the 1920s. And what it did is it actually raised the human body temperature by a constant one or two degrees, which meant like they had a small fever, and it literally burned fat with no change in their eating or exercise. <coughs> but it also came with massive side effects. Okay. It was one of the first drugs the FDA removed from the market in the 1930s when the FDA uh, came into being. Were there deaths? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because people thought, because remember, there was no regulatory Sure, body, and if right? you take a little bit, it's one, good. You two, take too yeah. much, and then you cook. Now, that did reemerge as a weight loss drug with Dr. Bashinsky in Houston, Texas, okay. many years later. Okay? okay. But that was the first drug that the FDA, one of the first drugs they removed. What we have is we do not have a good history at all with drugs and weight loss. After World War II, they were using amphetamines because in the troops, they learned that if they took amphetamines, they could stay up all night, they'd be more alert, you know, and that. And then that flooded into America during, after World War II. But then there were deaths from that because amphetamines caused heart attacks, racing heart, and finally we got rid of that. Then we saw laxatives, diuretics during the 1960s and 70s, right, as a form of weight loss. And hypoglycemic agents started to be used much more recently in the form of glucophage and metformin. These are diabetic drugs that you take orally. Um, They can have serious gastrointestinal problems, you know, explosive diarrhea um, and other kinds of things like that, Uh, hypoglycemia reactions. So it's not like hypoglycemic agents have not been around. They have been. And you know what? There was no success with those. There very little success. And when you stop using the drug, right, you go back to doing You don't learn to change your lifestyle habits. Right. Well, Ozempic has come out. I meant to ask you about that mm-hmm. one because that's uh, a part of a new class of, of uh, drugs. Hypoglycemic agents. Right, and I don't even think that it was originally intended for weight loss. No. It was intended for diabetics. Is yes. that correct? Yeah, but here's the problem that you have once again. 
almost everybody who used it when they stopped using it gained the weight back. Okay, so you can look that study up. You'll also notice that it, it can cause acute kidney failure. So this is in the list of side effects. It's rare, but it can happen. Do I even want to put myself in that in, into that situation? Risk, yeah. Because if 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 you take it and you lose weight on it, mm -hmm. you're going to want to keep taking it, and it, and so you need to be aware of the long term risks that are associated with that. What about in the but, case? But wait, wait, before you go on. But sure. here it's creating a whole nother problem. Diabetics are having a very hard time getting legitimate medication, Ozempic, for right. their diabetes because now doctors are administering this to people who aren't diabetic. The FDA has never approved it for weight loss. So it's off-label for weight loss. Correct. Okay. But here's what, what I see as a huge problem once again. When you medicalize obesity, you're creating another multi-billion dollar industry. See, so they want to medicalize obesity, like, hey, it's not your fault you're obese. You need this medication. It's a disease. No, it's not for most people, right? Obesity is a self-inflicted situation through lifestyle habits that have been bad for years. And people need to own up to that. But here's what's so sad about it once again. And keep in mind, I have great respect for physicians and doctors. As you know, I work with some of the finest. But when doctors start administering this to patients, there is an assumed or an implied, this is okay, this is safe, or my doctor wouldn't give it to me. They're the professional. Right. They're the all-knowing doctor. Mm -hmm. And this is what I call the medicalization of obesity. It's got to stop. So we have not seen any drug be successful. Look at FenFen. So when FenFen came out, I think it was in France originally, they noticed a 9% increase in the cases of something called PPH, which is primary pulmonary hypertension. Now, if you came down with that, the only cure is you have to have a heart and a lung transplant. Wow. So we saw all those deaths before it came to America. Now, we had access to those studies and information, but what happened? Doctors across the country started prescribing it. Now, your, your oath should be do no harm. But FenFen put together was a bad mixture that caused deaths. So, look, we don't have a good history of medical uh, devices helping with weight loss. We just right. don't. Or ph pharmaceutical and agents. And I'm telling you, Ozempic is here today, but HCG was here just two years ago, right? And so the HCG diet was there. So you don't expect too much no. uh, out, out of this in the long run. But look at the cost of it. We're driving up insurance. It's 900 and some odd dollars for a 30-day supply. And of course, people will pay it you know, just to have the weight uh, off. No, the, their the insurance off. are covering it because the doctor will say insulin resistance. And that's all you got to say, right? So now they have a legitimate, and it may not be real. Well, I mean, aren't some of these overweight people legitimately insulin resistant? I find that most even type two diabetics can be reversed if they change their lifestyle habits. I remember I headed up the diabetic ward at the Institute of Specialized Medicine, and I cannot tell you the, because I never kept track of how many, but it was an enormous amount of type two diabetics that were no longer diabetic. So and again, so they were literally um, they were literally uh, treated or uh, and and uh, uh, were not considered uh, uh, type two diabetics anymore after right. the lifestyle and dietary changes. Right. So that was within their control. They lost weight. They yeah. carried their own food and cooked yeah. it. They yeah. ate better. Yeah, they you know, and you're, you're 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 tying right into something that I wanted to do because you know this has been awesome. You know, but to finish up, I would just like for us to just quickly summarize some of the lifestyle changes that our listeners and viewers can make, you know, today, you know, to uh, uh, start feeling better and, and start experiencing, you know, better weight loss and better control of their, of their nutrition. Well, the first rule of thumb is let's not diet anymore. Okay. The second rule of thumb is if you want to have control over your health and your weight, you have to have control over the food you're putting in your body. So what, uh, you know how I told you, I'll sit down and look at the steps successful people take. Mm -hmm. Well, the next successful step is they cook and carry their food. Find some form of exercise or activity that you can do on a regular basis that you enjoy. So if it's dancing, dance. If it's weightlifting, lift weights. If it's activity. jogging, yeah, activity, right. something that you enjoy. And I, I always tell, uh, you know, everyone that follows me that you need to move every day. And remember that small changes 
create huge results over the course of time so long as they're sustainable. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the show, we looked at the effects of only a small change, two cans of Coke a day. Right. If you got rid of those two and found a diet that you don't mind drinking, you got rid of 60 pounds of sugar a year. Right. And, what, and what, cha what change does that make? Yeah. Again, you know. wine. If you drink two glasses seven days a week, Try it just on the weekends, or, or even just cutting it back one, you're cutting it in if half, you right? But again, you, know. you have to find what level do I believe I could live my life at with right. this, right? Right. So if it's two days a week, it's two. If it's three, it's three, but that's better than seven. That's right. Okay. Now, Keith, you have this documentary called Beyond Weight Loss. I've seen it. Right. It's fantastic. You know, and I, I believe there's a sequel coming out. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's not my documentary. I'm just in it. Okay. And it's, it's directed and produced by Tom Odar. Okay. And it's called Beyond Weight Loss. And where can we watch it? Uh, it's free on YouTube, but you can also watch it on um, Amazon Prime and okay. on most cable networks. Okay. Yeah, and what it is, it's discuss It's kind of like our discussion here. I'm doing reframing in it. I'm giving them the formulas, just like I gave the sugar formula here, divide the grams by four on a label, and that converts it into teaspoons. Well, I have several formulas like that to help people's awareness factor go up, right? Um, but we're now working on part two. Part one was so successful that all we're doing on this one is we're focusing on relapse prevention and the psychology of eating management. Which is right up the That's thing, all we're doing. Right up your alley. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've taken 10 of my clients that have lost up to over 100 pounds and kept it off for 15 and 20 years. That is amazing. And so, so, so these people have actually lost over 100 pounds and kept it off for 15 to 20 mm -hmm. years using your methodologies. Where do people get in touch with you for Lean Body Coaching? Well, they just Google leanbodycoaching.com and it will come up. And uh, that's our online program. And uh, we have real nutritionists that are there to work with you on these very things that we've talked about. And these nutritionists are trained by you. Oh, yeah. And they're also uh, degreed. Hands-on. And they're, they're the actual coaches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. that's Because yeah, see, what I said earlier, you have to associate yourself with people who possess the skills that you yourself don't. Right. That's the true definition of an entrepreneur, right? Well, in this case, you ha where do you find somebody who knows the truth and the right way to lose weight, where are you going to find that? So that's why they're there. They're just uh, implementing the philosophies I've developed over 40 years. Dude, this has been so good today. Any last things that you want to share with our audience? No. Listen, first of all, I appreciate all the work that you do, right? I, I think you. you've done a great job, and congratulations on such a wonderful career. Um, I don't have anything else to add, but I just want to say thank you for our years of friendship and for allowing me to be here today. And, and the feeling is mutual, Keith. Thank you okay. for sharing your wisdom, which is vast. Every time that I sit down and talk with you, I learn something new. Cool. Hey, guys, uh, help us to grow the Lee Labrada Show by hitting the subscribe button now. And please share this podcast with a friend that you think might benefit from it. Uh, it, by hitting the subscribe button, you will be sure not to miss any future episodes with great information that will help you to get into your best shape ever. So guys, stay motivated, look up, get up. God bless. The Lee Labrada Show. Thunder from a distant shore. Voices in my head imprison me. Wanna hold